Yeah, no, I, I think he's got a thing wrong. Uh, Sean is a co-founder of the Help Rosetta with Gay Chase. Um, and Sean is going to be leading our session today, so I'd like to introduce and bring Sean Shanton to the stage. Thanks, Sean, for being here today. So, um, so funny story is when I got engaged, my wife didn't know how to spell my last name. So I don't feel too bad that Michael can't pronounce it, even though we've known each other for a long time. And we're investors in the company. Um, so my name's Sean Chanson. I'm the co-founder of Help Rosetta. All of you probably know Dave. Um, he's the Twitter famous one, and I'm the one that doesn't want to be Twitter famous. And so um, we generally conceptualize this session of saying, there's so much around making things happen in healthcare that's just largely do crap for long periods of time, all the time, and get lots of people doing lots of crap to fix healthcare. It's not exactly as complex as it seems. It just requires consistent, regular work. If you talk to any entrepreneur about the amount of just dedication they put into making things happen, it's largely just grinding away. It's not very glamorous. And so, we wanted to have a session that would take all the energy and everything that we had from yesterday and then turn it into action that we could do in our communities. Because this isn't coming, as Dave says, the Calgary's not coming from Washington on healthcare. Um, it's coming from our own communities, it's built out from there. And um, we're going to build a much more, um, a movement with much more staying power if it comes from the grassroots. But if it's not, it's made on, it's built on thousands and thousands of stakes in the ground, not a couple big stakes. In, broad announcements to the world about how great we are. And so um, so the session, we're going to break into three things, three sections. Um, the first is building community, and Dave Chase is going to lead that. The second is um, getting deals done from a plan design perspective. And Dave Contorno, who is part of the Health Benefits Advisor Certification Program, is, um, is going to lead that up like logistics of actually doing it. How do plans work? What are the big documents? Who are the key players? Who do you have to get on board? Um, understanding which brokers you should probably focus on working with because there's a significant delta between um, brokers, we'll say. And if you think of them going through a transition like maybe stockbroker to financial advisor of today, um, lots of stockbrokers went away in the 80s because they didn't have value commensurate with the amount of money they took out of the system. Um, and so, just for those of you that don't know, I'll do 30 seconds real quick to get started on what the Help Rosetta is. So the Help Rosetta itself is a, is a crowdsourced blueprint for how to effectively and wisely purchase healthcare um, and build benefits plans. It's sourced from the real life successes of employers all over. So this isn't ideas that Dave and I made up or we thought that we think is great. It's just we went out, Dave started years ago, going out and asking employers what they were doing and what was working. Um, and then collecting it together under a unified framework to make it easier to adopt. Um, and then our company and our nonprofit, uh, we're a very mission driven organization. We're built with the help of that assist in our nonprofit and then um, is all built around advancing adoption of the Health Rosetta. Like our mission is to make every single company use the Health Rosetta as the foundation for their health plan. And good for all of you in the room, uh, value based, direct primary care is the foundational for care delivery within a Health Rosetta based plan. Um, proper functioning primary care. So, um, thank you everyone for showing up to all of this. Um, I'm going to hand it off to Dave to talk about building community. Thanks, Sean. Um, you know, and really, this whole Health Rosetta journey actually started with Garrison Bliss, and other early leaders in the direct primary care movement. That's when I started pulling on this string and realizing uh, that there was a completely different system that had to emerge. Um, and at a certain point you realize, gosh, the, the status quo system, if you think about it, it's, been, it's dystopia. I mean, it is bankrupting the country, it's bankrupting families, it's leading to record levels of burnout and suicide amongst doctors and nurses. I mean, it's really as bad as you can actually imagine. And then as I started really digging into the direct primary care and then things kind of related to that, I was like, wow, that's like utopia by comparison. 
I've done a lot of marketing. It's like, wow, this is just a marketing challenge. Like everybody would want that. How do we get that out there? And so that's really what it's about in terms of building community. And to the extent we know anything, it's because we pulled it out of use. So there's going to be a lot more interactive than presentation. Um, but I'll just set a little bit of context. Uh, I just finished reading this book uh, that came out. I'd recommend it. Uh, and it really echoes that theme of the Calvary's not coming from DC. There's a certain political, there's a certain narrative in the media that's coming from, you know, cable TV and talk radio. And you would think that our country is going to hell in a handbasket if you watch too much of that. Uh, this book really echoes what I, I found. Um, and he, he, James and Deborah Fowles fly all over the country. And it's really remarkable how community by community, people are solving some of the toughest problems in their community. And they, they didn't wait for somebody else. And that's where people will move past sort of the partisan uh, labels. They're just trying to get stuff done in their community. And, uh, you know, even through their journey, because I think it was started in 2014, 2015, you know, really even the national politics barely even came up. I mean, it was core stuff that came up during the election. Um, but it's really, it's inspiring read, um, but I think it's really what we're doing here is a reflection of that. I actually um, uh, reached out to James Fallows and, and he's really intrigued, you know, by what we're doing here. So maybe he'll write about that at some point. Um, and you've probably seen some variation of this graphic, uh, and this is really at the heart of what we're going to do in the breakout. And it looks at, this is a roll-up of a bunch of studies that Robert Wood Johnson Foundation study, the study of studies of what drives health outcomes. Um, and you know, it ranges from clinical care 10 to 20 percent, and the you know, social and economic factors, and you know, all these things you're probably generally aware of. And so for what we want to do here and what we want to accomplish in the breakout is really start thinking about who are the people in the community that really have a stake in the health of the community. Because, you know, we all know what we're doing in the you know, direct care movement is really the foundation of that. And so we want to focus in on those things. So literally, as we go in the breakout, we can put this back up on the screen when we go through. I want to get very tactical. Think about the people in your communities, you know, write them out. And there's probably some categories we've forgotten here. Like one of the things I would not have listed uh, on this until I read um, Our Towns was librarians. Really pivotal in communities. They really have a pulse on what's going on. In a lot of cases, they're filling gaps in the community as, as social, you know, safety net things have been removed or new challenge in the community. They are really rolling up their sleeves. Uh, I'm sure there's probably some others. Uh, but you look through these. I mean, some are obvious, obviously, in the, the clinical area, we all know uh, about that. Uh, we've, of course, talked a lot about employers, but there's very civic-minded business leaders, you know, some in the, you know, secular space in terms of, like, conscious capitalism and YPO, and then, particularly in certain parts of the country, you have uh, individuals that, you know, they might be going to prayer breakfast and they look at their um, you know, organization is almost part of the flock, and they're really concerned about what's going on in the community. When I talk to either of these and connect the dots on things like the opioid crisis and the broader issue with employers, they really want to solve that. Um, and then, of course, when things roll downhill, it hits the faith and social service leaders. They're pivotal in our group, in our communities. And, and then police and fire chiefs. Not only are they dealing with some of the fallout of our system, particularly with the opioid crisis, increasing the benzos issue, they're also very credible uh, and very connected. So we had a, uh, a couple of our advisors had an event in North Carolina. Turns out they were really the key ones to bring in like the state attorney general and the mayor and a bunch of other people uh, because they're on the, really on the front lines of these. So think about them and then, you know, on the, um, you know, left side here, you have the mayors, the school board members, the city managers, you know, all those sorts of people that are dealing with these issues. And we really want to reframe uh, the discussion. A lot of people look at, they think about healthcare and they just think about hospitals and they think about them as, as uh, a 
a large employer, which they are a large employer, and they tend to think of them as an economic driver. I argue very strongly, particularly in this next book, um, they're an economic drainer in most cases. Possible, the one exception is in rural communities. Um, and that there's real consequence to that. And it's not about bashing the hospitals, but it's about taking a full view of what's going on. Um, so be thinking about that. Um, and then just a few tips that I think are, are germane to how you build community. And really the entire point of uh, writing this book and publishing it is about activating the mayors, the school board members, the union leaders, you know, all these different constituents to realize they're all part of the solution and particularly on the opioid crisis. Um, it's something where, you know, as I mentioned yesterday, the efforts that have been going on so far have at best made very little difference um, with some, a few exceptions. At worst, they're making things worse. You cut off supply of prescription opioids to somebody who's already addicted. Surprise, surprise, heroin and fentanyl overdose deaths have greatly increased. Um, and so we need to really take that, that full look. And you know, the silver lining on the opioid crisis is uh, you can't solve it without going a long ways towards solving the larger uh, crisis. And so the things that we've seen work very well is you know these these sort of transcendent goals that cut across the silos. Um, you know, there's the old expression: "Crisis is a terrible thing to waste." Um, and we believe that uh, opioid vulnerability is really three levels of it. You know, as cl many clinicians in here, of course, there's the individual level. That's not really the domain of the health rosetta, you know, not getting the clinical delivery space, but that's, of course, really important. Um, there's the employer level, the benefits plans, um, frankly, are paying for the opioid crisis. Um, and in a lot of cases, the benefits designed pay for non-evidence-based things that are worsening the opioid crisis, and they don't pay for things that actually are evidence-based that will um, reduce uh, rates of addiction. Um, and then the community level, which is really the focus here, is we know if somebody's in recovery uh, and they go back to a community that uh, has a lot of the pre-existing issues, then the chance of relapse are extremely high. Um, and so it's actually something that we're working on is, is coming up with a met, um, score, basically, of communities at a county level, because that's where most of the data is, of a, a bunch of different factors to say, hey, you know, Kansas City, you know, your score is a 64, you know, you're a D or whatever, um, to really change the conversation and realize that we don't address these things. And by the way, if you look at the chapter 20 of my existing book, uh, and then the root of the book, um, I think I mentioned yesterday, really the, the biggest thing that will reduce the rates of addiction is getting proper primary care in place. Um, and so that's, I thought I just mentioned on this uh, opioid vulnerability. So critical to tap into pre-existing relationships and transaction patterns, even what we're doing with Health Rosetta, we, we have no interest in reinventing any wheels. There's a lot of great efforts going on out there. Um, and a lot of this is just providing connective tissue with stuff that's going on out there, and there's already very credible people and credible organizations. Um, so it's, it's, in some cases, being the glue between those. Um, and as I mentioned, bringing people together across these transcendent, unified ideas of not, you know, if you want to protect the status quo in healthcare or any other issue, politicize it. And, you know, the status quo has done a great job of politicizing healthcare. I think down at the ground level, people just want good health care um, and good value, uh, so you can move past that. Um, and you know, the thing that's really, I mean, I've seen it just in the individual conversation, but it was really uh, beautifully written in, in the Fallows book about how people really do love their communities, um, and they do want to uh, get things right. And then as they, they learn about what's going on, uh, it's funny, I had some variation of uh, I think Rob was, Rob Lambert was telling me when he was reading my book, he had to like stop and take a shower every once in a while as he was learning about it. 
And, um, and what it does is fuel righteous indignation. And that's what tends to energize people and say, okay, yeah, we're going to man and woman up and solve this problem. Um, and one thing that we've seen that is unfortunate in healthcare, not in this community, um, is that people kind of hold their relationships and they acknowledge his power or something like that. Um, and so that's not how you drive change. You know, I look at it as, you know, relationships are a renewable source. A lot of times you think people are connected and they're not connected. And the beauty of being in primary care is you touch a large part of the community and we often forget um, just how influential and trusted primary care is in the community. And, and as you think about some of those groups before, many, many of you have people who fall, there. you have patients who are um, fall into those buckets. You have neighbors, you have you know fellow churchgoers, you have uh, golfing buddies, whatever it is. Um, a lot of times that's an untapped resource. So really think about that. You know, this is a nice, a nice thing about these type of events is stepping away from the fray uh, and doing that. Um, and then as we go along, um, I mean, I sort of joke that, uh, and you see it here, if you just came to this event, you'd think, oh my God, DPC has just swept over the nation. Um, and, but that's how any of these things start. Um, and there's, you know, I kind of joke, it's a little bit of Wizard of Oz marketing, and there's real stuff, but also when that momentum is perceived at a certain point, what I've seen in healthcare in a lot of areas like that I've done in the past, had some success, is you know, the lemming effect works against you until you get it working for you, and part of that is highlighting the successes, even if they're little successes, success breeds success, and it also creates this air of inevitability. Um, so please do that. Um, so with that, just a couple additional readings. I have this link up on the screen. I think the hint folks are going to share the URL. So uh, I literally, Sean just gave me the first kind of proof of the book. That's the first time I've seen it in a while. Um, and you can download the PDF. Uh, the Starfish and the Spider, it's a good book. If you haven't read it, <laughs> talks about um, you know, very resilient uh, things. The analogy it's using is, you know, if you cut off the head of the spider, it dies. Um, you know, you cut off a, you know, arm of the, the starfish, it becomes two. And gives examples of how, you know, the Spanish conquistadors, you know, took out the Aztecs and so on by kind of, you know, killing the king, basically. Um, whereas the Apache never were conquered because there wasn't one single leader. And that's what we're really trying to do here, um, uh, is you, know, you are the leaders in your community or can be the leaders in your community. And the more broad-based it is, the more resilient it is. Um, and even better than resilience, I don't know, another book I like, um, I'll have up there is called Anti-Fragile. Uh, the idea is that you're not only resilient by shocks and attacks, you are actually strengthened by them. Um, and I think we set this up right, we will invite and we want to be a little stronger than we are right now, but at a certain point, that will actually help our movement. And you can rest assured the attacks will come. Um, and that should be a, a sign of you're making progress, not to be the time you've got down on. Um, and then in the book that you can download, Appendix B um, is about learning from uh, success and system change. I, I've been fortunate over the last year or two to become good friends with one of the most transformative thinkers I've met in my career. And he did some incredible work, really integral in, in lifting tens of millions of people out of poverty in India and then back now in the US, helping remake the food system. And some very different type of thinking um, and different types of funding models. Um, and it's really informed our thinking. Um, and so, he has a paper that he published there, and uh, I think um, you know one thing that uh, you know if you're going to read a, a blog, um, I think Sean has some slide later. You know, don't read VC blogs, which I agree um, as a general rule. Uh, but one blog to read, um, I think it's just localopenindependent.com. So they're kind of curated, and that's kind of the heart of 
of how system change is happening. Um, and so I'd encourage you to do that. So with that, what we're going to do is break out into groups by region. Do you have a particular uh, <coughs> level of region? The idea is we're going to have smaller groups. Go where your uh, thing on your top of your badge says. So west, let's say over here, northeast there, south and whatever, midwest over there. I forget what it's We love Midwesterners, so, uh, Sorry, yeah. And just generally, the, the goal of this is to, one, each of us is going to, and Michael are going to run one of each of these groups. Michael, Michael and David and Dave and I are going to each run one of these groups where we're, all we're going to do is just ideas. What you've been doing, what's been successful, what you haven't, and then we're going to come back and share all of these and just have ideas for everyone to see of what's working, what people are actually doing, because we're going to talk about principles, but the tactics are going to vary a lot, and mm -hmm. the best ideas are not going to come from us. I'm going to um, so we can talk cut about you off to and we're going to keep moving. Um, <laughs> that, I don't know all right, so we're going to do a couple of things real quick on the, um, I think we'll hold off to the, actually we can do it now. We'll, very quickly, if all the people that were leading the different groups want to come up and in 30 seconds identify some of the good ideas that came out of your group. So that everyone can hear. Okay. Um, so what we focused in on was identifying some of the types of organizations that should be involved that weren't already listed on the board. And I kind of broke it out between organizations that are maybe more relevant in a community over 200,000 people and under. This is going to be a little bit different, although of course there's overlap. So I'll just rattle off a few of those with some good ideas. It was of course Chambers of Commerce, bankers, both from kind of the financier side, that came up in the larger communities, and then in the smaller communities, community bankers. Um, there's the, the health underwriters, organizations, um, women medical organizations, Moms groups, um, people who are actually in addiction, you know, the state of addiction right now, if you want to call it that. Uh, and then there was the idea of, I didn't know what to call it, I call it kind of mayor slash council member emeritus. And a lot of times there's former mayors who are still, you know, helping guide the community and council members, um, particularly like in a college town, deans, presidents. Um, Coaching organizations, a lot of times youth coaches are almost substitute parent figures, they're credible uh, players in the community. Uh, there was a comment made that in a lot of communities, the police is essentially are the community psychiatrists. Um, so it's certainly there. And then those uh, next door, the website next door, there's a lot of community activity there. So th those were kind of the high points. And then what we um, asked people to do is just start writing down specific people that fall into the categories that are on the board as well as these that you can reach out to and start to communicate how you can be a part of the, the solution as well as the events that they go to, which was the third thing. And so I think that's great for, you know, on your flight back or, you know, while you're in the shower, just start thinking about those and start reaching out to people. So that was really the essence of ours. So, and if, if all you said it already, it's on your list. You let's say don't need to do it. So the South Southeast group, um, Kevin brought up um, Chambers of Commerce, and he did point out an inherent conflict of interest. I mean, the Chamber of Commerce wants a strong foundational community to attract businesses, healthier people, uh, but the largest employers in most markets are either the carriers or the health systems. So uh, there's definitely a potential conflict of interest, but there's an opportunity there. Uh, one of the things that we've done is we've engaged some um, prominent CEOs in communities and, and gifted them DPC memberships to a local DPC doctor. We've done that a few times. Get the CEO to realize that this is affordable concierge medicine, uh, for lack of a better description, and how they can improve the quality of care that they bring to their families by getting them and their own family engaged. Um, talk about building awareness um, from the physicians, and, and I, I think helping them understand. I, I, I watched Rob Lambert's um, TED Talk this morning, and it was a pretty 
moving uh, TED Talk on that and, and getting the, the clinical community engaged and understanding the damage that they're doing, which by the way, uh, I say about my own uh, profession as well and the damage that we're facilitating in doing it. Um, also churches, um, getting them involved and, and uh, um, there was some talk that some churches have even expressed an interest in uh, allowing a DPC practice to be opened within their, their church building, but a lot of times they themselves are employers and have um, have concerns over the cost and quality of health care for, for both their employees and their community. Um, and I think uh, that was pretty much where we got. So we led the West. The West obviously always does things very differently. Um, I was actually trying to really get the West engaged because it's kind of a with West and West and state of mind. Here's what I want the West to do, ready? <clears throat> We have 30 seconds. First 15 is I want people to circle an organization or an idea that hasn't been talked about right now. 15 seconds. Something you could just want one if you have one that's important to add as an idea. And then when you have one, I was going to go around and just, and these are not 15, these are not 20 second things, but just the idea. Tech leaders and investors need to get into this and continue to see it's a great opportunity and that'll fund additional evolution. I've gotten referrals from um, hospital social workers for their uh, uninsured population that don't qualify for Medicaid. We have uh, quite a few local colleges and universities that have great resources to um, This is a little different. We were just saying there could be other rallying cries besides um, opioid crisis, if that doesn't resonate as much in the community, it's the, the obesity crisis, other, other things like that. Suicide is a lot of attention. Oh, I'm not sure anyone has mentioned pharmacists, but I think it could be an important point. Yeah. Just if you have something incremental. Yeah. It could not, um, groups of certain types of employers meet on a regular basis, construction workers, manufacturers, legal, uh, real estate, trade associations is basically what, yeah, thank you. I, I would say that uh, these civic organizations could be supplemented by social media, and I'm, for example, an administrator of a group support market-based healthcare, where we discuss uh, pain management mandates, which are the source of uh, this opiate crisis. Uh, so DPC could help by the big and certain value those mandates and do it their way. Athletic trainers in every high school. Um, I was thinking of more along the obesity line, and we were, but boys and girls clubs, um, school principals. Uh, State Medical Association. I'd also say we could curate some success stories that have come from this um, and start to talk about not just the negatives of our system, but the positives. I know I myself am a recovering alcoholic, I'm a recovering obese person, I am a recovering um, smoker, uh, the list goes on. Um, but talking about how the clinical community helped me uh, lose 200 pounds, stay sober for 12 years, not smoke. Economic Development Council. Don't forget uh, the local news media and reporters, so a senior editor writing a letter to the editor, maybe releasing a public service announcement, or talking to a senior reporter who covers health stories. That's the last. So basically, I think we've covered one of them related to our local IGAs, someone's been working with. Um, Executive networking groups like YPO, YEC, EO, Vistage, groups like that, and then there's a company called Global First, and then also meetup.com. All right, so now we're going to move on to, and the, the, the next two sections are going to follow a similar format. Discuss a bit of principles, break into groups, come up with real ideas, come back, discuss, share learnings real quickly, move on to the next thing. Uh, and then the goal is that by the end of this time, you each have three little pieces of paper with specific ideas that you can go take back to your communities and actually be doing things. 
So a little bit on the plan design and execution. As you know, so for those of you that don't know, I'm a broker consultant. So for 24 years, I've worked with employers and helping them. You know, Matt. Well, for the first 17 years, it was putting spreadsheets together of Blue Cross and United and Cigna. Uh, but I want to talk a little bit about the challenges as to why breaking through my community is so tough. Um, first of all, you got to realize that most employers don't understand they're in the healthcare business. To them, we're delivering the results of other large players. So we can be less of a substantial name brand within their consulting ecosystem because they don't view us as really bringing a tremendous amount of value in the equation. When they're fully insured, we're not insuring the risks, we're not creating the plan designs, but we're extremely well compensated for this. Um, and so just to put it in perspective, on a 100 life employer group, 100 employee company, our typical revenue in the traditional model is somewhere between fifty and seventy thousand dollars a year um, on that one client, um, and it goes up every year because if we're being paid on commission, the rates go up ten percent, our revenue goes up ten percent. So if I do enough to make a million dollars this year, I'm probably going to make a million one hundred thousand next year without selling another lick of business. And so you got to understand that the, the hanging on to that and, and the lack of transparency that is traditional within our space is vitally crucial to the survival of some of these traditional brokers. That is what you're dealing with. Uh, you're dealing with an, a, a person, an entity that provides no value, is highly overpaid, and doesn't want anyone to know that. So when you keep in mind when you do that, now for those of you that know some brokers that are in the traditional space, I want you to know that my average revenue per client is up 22% from prior to doing this. So I'm actually making more money. The difference is, is the way that I'm compensated now is completely transparent. We strip out every single bit of backdoor deal. We align at every level all the incentives from all the vendors within the health plan space. And we charge our clients a flat fee plus a performance-based incentive where we set mutual goals, usually around reduction in spend, and then we tie bonus compensation to us when we achieve those trigger points. So it does differ. We like to say to a client, you know, what goals do you have? We, we met with a large employer uh, a few months ago up in Chicago, and they said cost is not our problem. That's not what we're concerned about. We're concerned about improving care and benefits. So great, well, DPC solves both of those things, but, um, but so, so setting those goals up, and uh, I, the most powerful question I can ask a prospect is I'll, I'll measure some sort of KPI on their plan, so maybe just per employee per year spent. Where are you at now? And I'll ask them a question they've never been asked before, which is, where do you want that number to be? And one of the things that our industry has done a really good job of is setting expectations so ridiculously low that typically all they say to me is, I just don't want that number to go up anymore. And I'm like, come on, give me a harder goal than that. Um, and so the, the next most common answer I get once I say, come on, challenge me a little more, is a 10% reduction. Now, when we build a holistic plan, which DPC is a part of, our average reduction in costs for year one of our engagement with that client compared to their immediate prior year is a 47.5% reduction. The worst job that we've ever done when a client has allowed us to do these, and not every client does, is a 24% reduction. And the best job was just a hair under 60. Um, that's a 47.5% average reduction on a company's second, third, or fourth biggest spend. This is massive EBITDA boosting dollars because it goes right to the bottom line. Now we do insist that some of that money be shared with the employees either in terms of better benefits, less money out of paycheck, or even direct cash. Uh, we have one client, small blue collar firm up in Madison, Wisconsin, they just got back from taking their entire company to Vail, Colorado with a piece of the savings year one with us, and every um, employee got an additional $600 in their bonus check at the end of the year, and that was only half of the savings. Um, that we generated. So how do we build this into a holistic plan that really, again, aligns the incentives? I, mean, I think that's one of the biggest problems in the entire continuum of healthcare delivery and financing is misaligned incentives, perverse incentives. Um, so how do we build this into a plan? Because I will tell you guys, it will not and does not work if you go to an employer 
and they keep their Blue Cross and Blue Ship plan and <laughs> tap on DTC onto the side. It's not going to work. It is not going to be effective, and it's not going to generate what we need to happen in order for this movement to continue forward. So, um, one of the challenges is is that we need to get some of the players to change in order to get this to happen. And as much, I'll go into an employer and I'll say, do you like your current health insurance plan and do you think you're getting a good price for what you're getting? Nobody says, I love my health insurance and think I'm paying too little for it. But as soon as I suggest getting rid of that name brand carrier, they all of a sudden, it's an interesting psychological phenomenon, they all of a sudden put that plan that they just told me they don't like and pay too much money for on this ridiculously high pedestal. And I'm now competing against some inflated version of what they currently have. And so I need to keep knocking them down to say, remember what you just said a minute ago, okay? And, and I think the fundamental reason they do this, I've really tried to narrow this down, is because in this country, we tend to intermingle the words healthcare and health insurance. And I will go into a, a, a meeting of employees where the employer has already said yes to me, and now I'm meeting with the employees, and I'll start off with this question. Who's your health care provider today? And everyone says Blue Cross, United, Sigma. And I go, guys, what you just did would be like if I asked you what kind of car you drive, and you said, I drive a Geico. <laughs> and so what we need to do is, is get them to understand that changing their insurance is not changing their relationship with the doctor. Now, we've been conditioned to think that because who do we go to when we need to go see a doctor to know what doctor we can see? Our insurance carrier. Who do we go to when we want to know what is covered medically? Our insurance carrier. Um, and so we've been conditioned to, to go to them. Everyone, hospitals are conditioned to go to carriers. Doctors are conditioned to go to carriers. Brokers are conditioned to ask carriers. Employers and patients were all conditioned to ask carriers, what can we do, where can we do it, and how much does it cost? So we need to disintermediate that. And when I go to employers, I say, there's only three stakeholders I care about. It's the payer, which is you, Mr. Employer. It's the patient, which is your employee. And it's the provider, which is their doctor. Everything else is noise. And I want to minimize that noise as much as possible. And where I can't, where we need some sort of intermediary to interact with the traditional system, such as a PBM, we're going to align all the incentives to benefit the patient and the payer, the employer. So I tell employers, you don't financially, you don't need to be self-insured to do what I do. The reason you do need to be self-insured in the environment is because the carriers won't let us do the things that we know work because it eats into their revenue model, number one. And number two, even if they did, they don't give us the transparency we need to hold the rates that they're giving us accountable to those improved outcomes or lower costs. So it's not that a, as a financing mechanism, fully insured doesn't work, it would at least if everyone in the pool or the majority of people in that pool were doing it, it's that we don't have the transparency or the flexibility to do it. So um, the other myth out there, once I say that, is, oh, we don't want to be self-insured. That's too risky. You're already self-insured. Unless you're an employer of under 50 employees, in some states, I think California, I know New York, it's 100, but when you're above 50 in most states, employees, you're what's called experience rated and fully insured. And that means that the carrier has a pool, what, and, and they derive rates from that pool called manual rates. And then they have experience-based triggers that they can use to increase those rates or to lower those rates. And many states, the swing from the highest rate to the lowest rate is as much as 67%. So there's a pretty big level point in there. So if Employers would say, well, I have no risk fully insured. I go, really? So if your employees spend a lot of money on health care, do your rates not go up next year? That sounds like risk to me. It may not be immediate risk, but it's still, you're paying the consequences of the utilization of the plan of your employees. So the only difference between fully insured and self-insured is that fully insured, you don't know what happened until it's too late. They don't give you any tools to do anything about it. And if you're doing impact change positively, you don't receive the benefits of that. In a self-insured plan, we have tremendous operational flexibility. We have far fewer mandates that we've got to follow. 
and uh, we eliminate a lot of the, the Obamacare taxes and fees, so there's some, some real savings there. Uh, but it is not more risky. Now, it could be. I can make it extremely risky if either I didn't know what the hell I was doing or the client said, that's what we want. We want that risk. Because for those of you that don't know, the way a self-insured plan works, from an employee perspective, it's the same. It's an ID card, it's a set of benefits, here you go. From an employer perspective, it's just a change in cash flow. Instead of essentially paying worst case scenario every month, which is what the health insurance premium is, you pay a set of fixed costs to run the plan, also premium for stop loss, which is the mechanism to prevent the risk of big claims, and then you agree that you're gonna pay up to a certain amount on each employee on their small and medium claims. That's all that self-insured is. But that gives us the transparency and the operational flexibility. So that's why you need to be self-funded. Um, and so a quick uh, breakdown, too, of, of ASO versus independent TPA. ASO, which is an acronym for administrative services only, it doesn't really mean this, but in the industry, when you say ASO, that's a self-insured plan with a blue bag. And I've been to many of these carriers' home offices, and I will tell you that the systems that the carriers are running their claims on literally is a green screen of text that looks like something out of War Games, the movie. Um, it is extremely antiquated, and I say to brokers or employers, if you've taken a fully insured Blue Cross and Blue Shield plan and flipped it over to a self-insured Blue Cross and Blue Shield plan, you've changed nothing. You're literally riding on the same exact system that was driving your rates before. Maybe you eked out a few percentage points of profit with the carrier, and you've certainly given yourself more insight into how badly you're being screwed, but you've not changed a single thing. In an independent TPA, first of all, they, their claims processing, we typically see a 17.5% reduction in total costs by going from a VUCA TPA to an independent TPA and not changing anything else, not changing the PPO network, not changing the PDM, not changing the benefits at all, 17%. And why? Carriers are incentivized to overpay claims. They make more money as underlying medical costs go up, and if they pay a fraudulent claim now, they get to recover that money a year later, and they keep 30 to 100 cents on every dollar that they recover. Look at how good of a job we did. We overpaid your claim a year ago, and now we're taking some more of that money a year later. It's ridiculous. So again, the other challenge we have is we have to get them to an independent TPA. Remember, I said earlier, people think healthcare and health insurance are the same, so they think if now we're going from Blue Cross and Blue Shield to some TPA I've never heard of, that my health care has gone from a known name to an unknown name, even though that's not true. Uh, those are the type of psychological barriers that we have to break. So when we look at our plan stack, this is how we build a plan. It's really not that complicated. Um, but we want to make sure that everything is aligned. And so we really believe that the value-based primary care which DPC is really the foundation of, uh, is, is the core to all this. Um, it really is the foundational piece that is going to change healthcare. So we talked about independent plan administration. Uh, plan documents, it, when you, as we in, embrace this DPC movement, it is extremely important that the plan document, that is the Bible for every employer's health plan. It drives their risk. It drives the benefits. It drives stop loss. My friends from One Beacon are here. They, they make their stop loss so simple. They say if it's in the plan doc, we cover it. And if it's not, we don't. So that plan doc is really important for that employer's risk. Um, and then, of course, transparency with me, with how we get paid. So um, right now, we're at this growth point where we're trying to curate a demand and a supply side problem. We have tremendous supply side problems on the primary care side. We have a complete lack of primary care in general, right, of doctors going into school for primary care. And then when you think about that small subset of miserable doctors, there's even a smaller subset of those that have stepped out of those lanes to come to an event like this. Um, and so we have tremendous supply side issues. And from an employer perspective, I talked about PPC and guys, Every single employer that I've spoken to has embraced the concept of this when it's described properly. But the next question they ask is, well, how many DPC doctors are going to serve the areas where I have employees? Well, there's none over there, there's one over there, there's two over there, but they do, one has a pharmacy, one doesn't, one covers this, one doesn't, one's 150 bucks and one's 70 bucks. 
That's really difficult conversation. Employers are very loath to offer benefits in which they can't offer the same benefits at the same cost to everyone. They're, they, they really struggle with that. Um, so we have to sort of stair step up this supply. And then I hear from doctors, well, I don't want to flip over out of fee for service until I know the patients are there. And I can't bring them the patients until the doctors are there. So there's this definite chicken and egg thing that we're, we're managing. And the, the solution, I think, is to sort of stair step it up. So I brought five employers to the table in Salisbury, North Carolina, a little town about 45 minutes outside of Charlotte, where we had five employers all come to the table. We had a, a, a DPC doc who's actually speaking upstairs right now agree to fund a, a location because we had enough membership in that town to make it at least cash flow neutral day one. So we can help build the demand. We need to just all work together to do that. Um, and then providing accountability. So I found within the DPC space, there's a broad spectrum of mindset. Um, you know, at, at the one end, you have the Alex Lickermans upstairs who say, we're going to embrace data, we're going to be savvy marketers, we're going to communicate with the, the payer, the health plan. Uh, and then the other extreme would be my friend Josh Umber at, a, at, a, at a Wichita who feels, I don't want to even touch those things, just give the employee money and let them do what they want with it. Um, I'm not sure that that's really scalable, but that's, those are the types of mentalities even within the DPC space that we're dealing with. So um, we're building it, it's coming, there's employer interest, I think brokers are starting to turn around. I really believe, guys, above anything else, we are at a pivotal moment in our healthcare system in this country. And I think, I see positive opening of minds occurring right now. And so we need to continue to foster that collaboration and that education, and I think we can make this successful. Thanks everyone. Uh, or thanks Dave. <laughs> uh, we're going to do the same thing split up a little bit. Uh, we've got another handout in 10 minutes. And this time we're going to do five minutes of everyone kind of writing their own things. And then 10 minutes of, um, or five minutes of, doing their own, of writing their own things and five minutes of sharing with their group. And then we'll recollect here. And one point, one of the things we're working on this year for Health Rosetta is being, doing market making for the supply and demand issue. Um, in, in areas where we can. So if you haven't signed up for our newsletter, sign up for it because we're going to start rolling this out. You can apply here from it from Michael and Zach and everyone as well. Um, but let's break up the group again. All right, we're going to start covering um, the things that we went over and what everyone did, regardless of whether people are still talking about it. So we can find ourselves on the right of the I'll just jump in and start throwing out the ideas. First uh, question was around potential employers. So people wrote down for themselves in specific companies, but we'll list here are specific categories or industries. So some of the ideas that came out, uh, truckers, uh, retailers, uh, small restaurants, community colleges, law firms, home builders, local motels and hotels. Uh, tech startups, office parks for both the employees of the real estate company as well as potentially a tenant. That, um, you know, they maybe put a DPC clinic in an office park. Um, municipalities, in terms of some other players sort of in the ecosystem, uh, you know, there's some good PDMs, uh, large independent IPAs, some of the state employer unions state employee unions, rather. Um, so those are some other categories. And then some demand building ideas. I'll just share a few. Public seminar. We have something we just put together for advisors that can lift it, call it event in a box. And we'll probably start providing uh, some pre-built decks. The other thing I'd encourage you to do is just rip off anything that's in my book that's helpful. And a lot for like op-eds. Take it, spin it for your community, local hook. That was one of the ideas was a local news plug. Uh, you know, DPC Doc, who uh, you know reached out to the media, and you know the angle initially was you know Doc who doesn't take insurance, and then there was also a follow-on on you know Doc who does a house call. They went out on a house call, and you know the Doc 
talked to patients, you know, he got all kinds of uh, spin up with patients sharing, of course, in, in social media. Uh, one of the ideas there, even just, you know, what we heard yesterday, um, you know, the example like your burden plumbing or something like that. Um, these little videos that can go on social media and get posted on LinkedIn and Facebook kind of go viral. You know, you need nothing more than a, a smartphone. Put it out there, selfie video. That stuff gets out there and you have some great stories uh, in your base. Uh, newspaper articles, contributed articles, um, you know, of course, patients that you have who are influencers. Um, and then there's some ideas around, you know, kind of talking about getting some of the unhappy employees within an organization, pulling people in. And then uh, Chamber of Commerce was brought up again, and one thing I mentioned, you know, the content you can rip off. Uh, in this next book, I've got a chapter on economic development 3.0 that kind of debunks the notion of a hospital as an economic driver. There's content like that that, again, just rip it off, make it applicable to your team. So that's what we have. Um, one of the things that I, I have definitely identified and I think was echoed in the group is that the blue collar firms tend to um, be the ones that more embrace the, the type of innovation that we're talking here. And I think the reason for that is a couple fold. Number one, those much more tend to be family owned businesses. I think they really care about their employees. Number two, they don't have the revenue growth trajectory that the tech companies tend to have in some of the other sectors. Uh, number three, they have smaller profit margins, so the pain point is greater. Um, I uh, talked about an AA saying, but the pain, if people don't change until the pain of staying the same outweighs the pain of change. And I think that that's true. The pain point is greater in those blue collar firms. Uh, one thing I forgot to mention in our group that we've actually been talking with is a company called WeWork. Does anyone hear that company? One of the things that we're looking at doing with them is putting a DTC practice, even if it's only a part time, in their WeWork location, not just for their tenants but also for the, the surrounding community as well. Um, so um, Regis, I don't know, we have their favorite company, but we work, seems to be more um, kind of grassroots and easier to work with, but um, that was another opportunity. And um, you know, so the type of employers are ones that I've, all, that I've sought after for a while. They care about their employees, they know their employees. Um, in, the, in the book that, that Dave wrote, um, he talks about an employer, Harris Rosen, who owns Rosen Hotels, and, um, five or six hotels down in the uh, Orlando area, 2,000 employees, and when I was with him walking through his hotel, he knew every single employee's name, their kid's name, what age they were. I mean, it was extremely impressive. And so those type of employers have really embraced this, so finding those employers and doing it. Um, every single employer I've spoken to at DTC loves the concept of it. So we're curating those employers that have the motivation but aren't quite understanding how to build it in. Um, with the, the meetings in a box that helped Rosetta starting to put together, I think there's another way of doing that. Um, and so, you know, finding that need, uh, the, the average out of pocket on a health plan today in the country is $5,143. That leaves a huge gap between we, we've removed the care that we need and we're <coughs> only ensuring the care that we shouldn't need or want to minimize. But what we've done is we've increased the likelihood of needing that higher cost care by eliminating the coverage for the lower cost care that helps manage that. So um, so we write, so those are the type of employers that we've found work and that was echoed with the DTC docs and the group that have engaged and embraced the employees. I was going to ask the West, is there anything that we that we talked about or that you guys captured that we didn't talk about that you want to add that's incremental to what we shared already? So one of the things, is, uh, especially around this area, is a great hunger for alternative care, um, which could be essential oils, Ayurveda, uh, Chinese, combined with the traditional medical. So DPCs are better able to customize that, you know, uh, and there are packages which include both. Uh, I'm sure that uh, the interest would be much greater. And along those lines, we have two gentlemen here from doTERRA. So for those of you, my wife is a big fan of doTERRA. They're uh, you know, an essential oil uh, foundation that has a, you know, a marketing um, channel for it and, and, and tremendous clinical and, and uh, research on the essential oils and, and the impact that it has. So if you're looking for a credible outlet, 
for that, if you embrace that type of non-traditional care, there's you got a couple people in a huge organization to support that. I agree with David's point that blue collar industries might embrace this because the pain is greater. On the flip side, tech companies compete like hell for great candidates, and benefits is one of the ways that they do that. And if we can find a way to tell a story that this is a fundamentally better model of care, then I think you could really start to see some uptake in those communities. I agree, but we, I mean, we, the problem is, again, if you go back to what I said earlier, which is people think health care and health insurance are one and the same, and then we have to change their health insurance in order to do this properly, they view that as a, at least a temporary period of great disruption, and they freak out over their ability to attract and retain talent. There's a message, there's a way to do it, and what we really need is to find that one tech company to step outside, and then if you think about what is potentially on the other side of that discomfort, is the best goddamn benefit package of any employer in the space at no cost to the employee. Like, they could have a message that would kill every, every Google and Apple would be crushed for talent if they could do this, or they were willing to do this. So if we need to curate that one technology firm that really says, this is something we believe in, and we're going to go through that discomfort period. Well, and in tech, don't you have, what, what you say, to find one of these companies that are rapid growth early, very small, and if they do this that way, Yeah, well, the challenge is, though, is there's right. lots of companies right here in San Francisco yeah. that are that potential growth and that never grow. So yeah. we have to maybe curate a thousand of those to find the one that becomes a name brand and five years down the road. They invest in them, too. I agree, yeah. But the also yeah. tech companies, I think, would say they're already doing that with have, having a crossover or a one medical, you know, they think they're already they think doing they're that. Doing. So yeah. what's the argument? That's the point. Is it, well, it's to show them how a, a local community direct current their dom improve the outcome care. You know, we're constantly comparing DPC to the traditional piece of service, but I think there's going to be time out that part of the road where we compare non-traditional primary care to other non-traditional primary care and start to gain some accountability. I don't have any insight into that. I would imagine that local DPC doc does a better job, but as compared to the our health or, or some of the, the clinic based models there, but you need to add that job, especially with technology. I mean, do you guys have any kind of a pulse on what's going on here in San Francisco? with the Amazon, Berkshire Hathaway, Chase bill. I mean, is there any insight into what the opinions are on what we do? I, yeah, I'll, well, I'll give you the one insight I have. So I have a client that um, I've had for 15 years, based in up just north of New York City, and we finished their, I've been, they've been gone on 15 years, but only a year and a half ago did they let me start to bring them down this path. We finished off year one at a 24% reduction from the prior year, so now they let me rip the bandit off. So I come into that, end of year financial meeting showing a 24% reduction, and here's our plan to increase that for next year. Well, two weeks later, the CEO of that company emails me, and he says, Dave, I just got out of lunch with Jamie Dimon, and it was me and seven other business owners, and everyone was complaining about the cost of care, healthcare, and I tell them, we just saved a ton of money, and here, he's a big Lean Six Sigma guy, so he calls all my crazy ideas countermeasures. He says, here are all the countermeasures we put in, Jamie Dimon, including of DPC, says, I've never heard of any of those things. This was just, I don't know, what, six weeks ago? Eight weeks ago? Um, so, you know, I think to Dave's point earlier, this, the solutions aren't coming from Washington, and I don't think the solutions are coming, at least I'm not going to hold my breath for it. If they do something transformative, even if they're just a lightning rod of attention, I think that there's some value in that. But I wouldn't be expecting them to not, to not only create this massive change, but then we have to hope that they create the change in a way that we believe in. And those are two things that I think are relatively unlikely. If it happens, how do we influence Well, we, we've been So we can have a whole discussion there. I'll just put it so shortly. They read my book, and they're aligned. So that's about all I can say. But, but I also would echo what David said. Like, that's nice. We may win the lottery on that one, but it's grinding out 50-person company, 100-person company, 250-person company. They could turbocharge that. I'd be thrilled, and you know, I'm placing one you know, chip on that. Uh, but I, I think a lot of this is not sexy. It's getting into your community, making change happen, community by community. Um, Sean, you want to wrap up your, your quick question? Though. Yeah. Uh, 
yesterday one of the speakers had some data that they just gleaned off of Glassdoor or something about uh, how the uh, response rate for their uh, ads for jobs like jumped up dramatically uh, uh, when they were offering uh, more robust health care. Do we have any kind of data like that that we could put in the hands of the VPC docs that are trying to hit up the 100 or 200? Yeah, so let's be clear about the data. Um, these are like micro data little experiments that people are doing. Um, like anecdotes, and so yes, um, talk to Dave Berg, sitting right there in the middle about that turnover issue, because they redirect's probably done more on this than anyone, and maybe you and I will talk offline and we'll push something out there to help Rosetta. But yeah, there is some of that stuff, and it's good storytelling, I think, uh, clearly if you can justify it, but the people that have done the most that I'm aware of, which isn't everyone, is, is Dave Berg. And that actually brings to one last point on, from our group, is PEOs, um, and those organizations that are smaller and sub-50 that do not have insurance at all uh, for their clients. Is, so you're, it's the lowest thing through for DPC. Restaurants are good for that. Real estate okay. agents. Yeah. Can I just uh, uh, share my reaction, Dave, to what you've been speaking about from your own store and how yeah. to amplify it? The, the sort of transcending thing, as far as I can tell, is how we should be mindset, how we can do that. And I think you're doing a phenomenal job of doing that. The only problem is how can we amplify it in a way that it gets out more. Not everyone's going to read Dave's book. So, you know, but if, you want, if you want to go beyond that, then, then, then how do you train people to do this? So, be so, patient. Yeah. How's Rosetta? No. Um, <laughs> we're working on this. Because <laughs> mindset shift is literally the first the step one of adopting Pop Rosetta in our mind and something we've done over and over again. Yeah. We're working on ways to experiment with making that replicable and then making it so you can train others. Exactly. So there's, there's some steps in there to do that are going to be part of it. Well, just give an example. Yeah, I mean, just an example that, you know, we're just getting started. Um, but I've also seen these things from you know, inception and how it gained steam. You know, I started Microsoft's healthcare partner ecosystem and signed the first partner. And there's 28,000 partners and it's two or three billion dollar business. It takes a while to grind that out, but it starts at this level. And there was an idea that was just shared uh, with me on, you know, I said, hey, rip off what's in my book. You know, we could probably go to the next step and almost have like, you know, uh, what is that thing where you, you fill in the blanks on, Mad, yeah, yeah, Mad Libs, yeah. Do a little Mad Libs with some of our uh, content to make it available. I mean, again, any ideas like that, I love it. Because we want to make it, put these tools out in the community with people who are credible, connected, you know who's influential, you know what publications, local blogs, mommy blogs, whatever it is. Um, you know, we love those ideas. And most of them come from just people doing it, and then we hear about it later, like, wow, that's great. Maybe we'll add a few wrinkles to it. And then we I think it's good people understand and that they don't have to be a victim to. of the system. <laughs> Employers, patients, you don't have to be a victim of the system. You have leverage and control. Very short? Definitely. Okay. So something I, I think we haven't really talked about a lot is the collaboration, the partnerships that could happen. And, uh, we're, so Redirect Health, in our Phoenix area, where we're, we just DTC, we have clinics there, not all over the country, yet, but we're using Sidera to create a product for people, a solution for people who could, can't afford their employer plan. So there, there's opportunities there with partnerships that we can never do on our own. Drug primary care on its own, trying to plug into a Blue Cross plan, it's so hard. Yeah. But when we create an alternative with Sidera, it becomes easier. Well, so think of the partnership that you create, too, that didn't exist last year. And everyone, be patient with Michael and Graham and Zach, because they're working on all that stuff too. Um, okay, so we're gonna move on to the last part, replicating growth of a new health ecosystem, which is my portion of the presentation. And so, some of you have some momentum already. <coughs> and um, no momentum, no problems on all of this. So, um, once you get this building community and wins, you've already got some community, so how do you catalyze that? How do you keep that going? Um, a lot of great ideas um, get going and get this great initial adoption and everything, and they just kind of 
peter out. And so how do you continue that and replicate that in your own community? And so if it's going to be sticky for direct care, like we need broad adoption. And so I don't know if any of you have ever seen this before. For anyone in San Francisco, this is probably one of the most overused graphs on earth. Um, but it's pretty right. Um, people adopt things at different times. And so right now, we're sort of in the innovators and maybe a few of the early adopters. Um, ignore everything else. And, and I talk, when I talk to, um, maybe, yeah. Ignore everything else because that's what you're trying to find over there. So what you're in is an emerging category. And the way that you grow things in emerging categories is different than the way you grow things in mature categories. And since healthcare has been mature since the beginning of time, um, there hasn't exactly been a lot of brand new, ground up type things before. And so a lot of you may not have experience of building these sorts of things from scratch in a category that doesn't exist and you don't know how to describe what you do exactly. And so the way to think about it is fat top, narrow bottom. Reach lots of people, that's my community, and then you set disqualifying criteria of who you do not want to work with and who you do want to work with and only engage those you want to work with that are likely to be early adopters. And everyone else, you can put into some nurturing mechanism to build a relationship with. We'll be launching more of that with Help Rosetta later this year, but then we're going to be building nurturing infrastructure that all of you can use. Uh, we do it with the advisors. We just launched that this month. But so, so that you can think of it as a funnel. Yeah, think of it as a funnel. For your not, those of you not in sales, it's called a sales funnel. You know, you try to get someone out the bottom, but that's that was wide funnel. Yep, and that was my next sentence, so perfect. Um, funnel, lots of people at the top, spread the word, focus on the people who are actually gonna do anything by setting this qualification criteria and just saying who you're gonna work with. And there's kind of entrepreneurship lore around um, great companies are built off of what people say no to, not what they say yes to. And so focus on that as far as replication so that you can keep the momentum going because word will spread off of that. Um, and so, the way that I think about it is more people leads to more money, leads to more replication. Because the reality of this is this is all going to require financing, it's going to require all sorts of things. Um, so, the more community you win means the more first wins you would get, which means people start talking to each other, which builds more employer demand. More employer demand creates more financing options, which creates more market options, which creates more replication, more clinicians and facilities coming to it because they see the light and more direct care stickiness. Um, it's just grinding it out over and over and over again. Most of entrepreneurship and building something from scratch is not glamorous. Um, there are a lot of creation myths in building things from scratch. And so um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about this. Simple tactics for building employer demand. We talked about this a little bit before, but some very specific ones, like show the future, like credit clinic visit program. Have people come into your office and see how different it is compared to what they're used to. Um, there's a reason why we call environments we don't like clinical environments. Um, it's very clinical seeming. Show that it's more humanistic. I mean, uh, James and Emily, wherever they are, are my personal DPC doctors in, in LA, and they don't even have like a like a gown, weird table in their main meeting room. Um, and so I was sitting down and chatting with them generally when I go. That's a big difference. Um, be a stakeholder resource. I can't emphasize this enough. Just be helpful for everyone you can. Help them understand, and then give as much as you can. And then, honestly, leverage your trust. For better or worse, society puts doctors on pedestals. Part of the reason we're in this mess um, as a society, and part of the reason that we can get out of it, is that um, clinicians are highly respected. And so when you speak to employers and others, people are going to believe you more than they're going to believe David Conforno, for example, or me, or Dave Chase. Um, Again, um, winning your tribe to build momentum, um, showing the, show the dream, um, which I call, if you're trying to build momentum, you need to get other clinicians on board. And so, think living well is the best revenge. You guys are all, I've heard enough of your stories, you're all much happier, even if you're making less money than you were at uh, a big health system or wherever you were. Um, also, bring the best into your deals. If you get an employer, like, share the love, bring them in, because that's gonna grow the category. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of, healthcare has a history of building tiny little fiefdoms that everyone wants to control everything about. Um, that's just not a good idea for building in a new category. Um, so sharing what you can, bringing others into your deals, even if it means you only get 200 of the 250 patients in a big employer that you win. Um, and defining metrics. This is the other thing you have a really good opportunity to do is build the anti-macro. 
if you're sick of everyone micromanaging your process, define how employers and others should hold you accountable to show that you're good and define the future. At some point 40 years ago, clinicians gave up this power somehow and, um, and the, everything just cascaded from there. I've spoken to dozens of clinicians about this specific issue. And so um, defining new metrics of how to be held accountable with people, and that alone will differentiate you and that will get people more and more persuaded that you are um, on their side. And I was a lawyer, I'm used to this intense tribalism where you, you basically join a cult when you go through certain types of professional training programs and it, it colors you for the rest of your life. And but so, note that there needs to be a level of accountability. I mean, yes. Employers are demanding this guy. So not having accountability is not an option if you want to be successful. But you want you need to create that accountability. What metrics are important to your practice? Well, just sort of to, to, to respond to that, it seems that the primary hypothesis here is that if you have really good primary care, all your other costs go down. So the data is actually in the employer's hands. In fact, we found it's really difficult to actually get the data from the, uh, from the, from the brokers or from Which, the uh, yeah. Yes, and it's even harder for the brokers to get data from the carriers sometimes. So this is a challenge, we'll just take time. Working with the right benefits advisors is critical for this because honestly, all the money savings and everything is really only going to come if primary care can shake everything downstream. Just at a population level, what costs a lot of money and what doesn't. And so having a benefits broker that can um, build into the plan design to other things that are going to deal with all the downstream, more costly things, is critical. So uh, we get, they might run a small seed fund that does tech only investing. Um, it's very, very small, and we, but we get a lot of people from DPC and others coming to us about investing. Most DPC is not venture backable, and I would generally not try to make up a story that it is, um, because you probably can uh, with some investors. There's lots of money out there. Um, I would instead be thinking through starting your community and making it about community investment. Think Green Bay Packers, not Facebook. And so there are lots of different financial structures for doing this. There's debt, there's equity, there's hybrids, there's all sorts of ways you can do it. And the advantage that you have is that healthcare revenue is generally very sticky once you get it. And so building some starting point creates the opportunity for creating equity or financing models that don't necessarily uh, make you give up control or require you to grow into something you're unlikely to be. Um, I've seen some financials of organizations that are in, in care delivery that are very highly unbelievable from an investing standpoint for venture because I can tell that they're building the financials to make it seem appealing to investors. So think more broadly about this. Um, liquidity wins hearts and checks. First rule of being rich, stay rich. That's it. So if you work on debt things, and so if you get people coming in, you win some employers, think in terms of like operating capital, things like that, where you may be able to have some sort of deal where that employer, if they, have, if they run a 250 person family business, they might be quite wealthy and throw $100,000 in debt into the, in, as part of the deal as well. So there's lots of different ways to think about this, but start with your community and the relationships and the people that care about your communities um, and not going off here or whatever to do all these things. Um, the, I mean, we won't get into venture returns, but they're not good as an asset class. Um, so, and honestly, there's other ways to find this business, like revenue, thinking about timing of revenue. Um, as I say, revenue is the land of milk and honey when it comes to building a company. It, it fixes all ills. And stop reading VC blogs, I get lots of people coming to me about, well, so-and-so says, is that maybe well good if you're building some tech type thing, but generally not great for services companies. Um, and finally, small is beautiful, small is sustainable, small means you get to keep your weekends. The bigger the thing you try to create, um, the more it's going to consume every aspect of your life for very long periods of time. And so thinking consciously about how you're going to finance your growth um, and thinking creatively about it and starting in your community is probably going to be much more successful than other things. Um, and think about the story you can have to an, a local company owner that you finally build up, you win a couple small companies, you finally build up to win that 250 person company and that person is a local kind of influencer around you, um, and you come in and you say, I'm going to make your EBITDA better, I'm going to make your employees happier, I'm going to make sure that they get best care, and your family office, I'm going to get them 10% interest on your to invest in this and have a piece of the returns that come from all of this. And it becomes much, much more about 
This is a strategy for them to build their own community, rejuvenate their own communities in a way that they've never, probably never seen before. So if you don't know the Green Bay Packers analogy, the Green Bay Packers are owned by community members in the state of Wisconsin, uh, largely, and because they're so broadly held, it makes them very hard to buy, which is part of the reason that they're able to be stay in Green Bay, not the biggest market on earth, and be very successful um, generally over long periods of time. All right, so that's it. Uh, we're going to break up one more time into our communities, talk about or to our groups to see a replication, and then we'll wrap things up and be done. We're going to wrap up real quick. I know there's a lot of conversations going on, which was the whole purpose of this session. However, I want to respect uh, Ken's schedule on everything. So we're going to wrap up real quick, and then if everyone wants to keep talking, obviously feel free to. Um, We'll just let Dave start, and then we'll throw everyone on all the ideas in here. Okay, on the more people, uh, you know, a lot of it is just, it's the same group of folks that we talked about earlier in uh, the first breakout. So if we just pulled out a couple that weren't mentioned, uh, you know, in terms of some of the other categories. Uh, I think we might have mentioned economic development directors. The one that just came up was um, gyms and health club owners potentially doing some uh, packages there. Um, and then I will just jump to the more stickiness. Um, and in terms of the, the challenge, I was a challenge for those who are in communities where we didn't know really they're the only independent position where they have to gobble up. And the monopoly hospital kind of does rent seeking behavior in terms of you know, if you don't want access to data. Um, you know, they want to charge 600 bucks a month and non compete and there's some questions to whether uh, they're competitive for every uh, But one idea that I particularly liked was, particularly as, as folks are trying to build up their practice, you know, some EPC docs or do hospitalist or urgent care or hospice. Um, but one is, is yeah, the idea of not only positioning work, in urgent care, but that's basically lead generation. So it's like people are coming in, I need to ask you people, you know, it's sort of, why are you here? It's something that could have been handled in a primary care clinic. Well, they don't have it. So, you know, let them know. And actually, I said, well, doesn't the urgent care owner get irritated about that? Like, no, they don't really want to see people who are just coming in for basically what should be handled in the family medicine scenario. So you can kind of earn money and earn leads at the same time. So that's all I've got. Um, so, um, you know, we're talking about how to really build the scale on this. And I think arming the VPC docs, what we were talking about a lot of this session, even if we're slightly off topic, is how do you arm the provider, the doctors, with the information to help make this work with an employer? And so one simple solution that, that David Burke kind of brought up was the severity. So Severa is a non-faith-based health sharing organization. And we were doing the math on it. On a family of four, DPC membership and Severa. So the DPC membership is covering, well, you guys know what that covers. And then Severa covers with a $1,000 unshareable amount. So basically per episode of care, the member would be responsible for the first thousand and then unlimited coverage above that uh, was 750 bucks a month um, for a family compared to the average family premium of 2200. So there's a solution for the smaller groups where employer mandate doesn't apply because this doesn't meet the requirements of the employer mandate. And just to clarify, the employer mandate is unchanged, untouched, and not going away anytime soon. The individual mandate that was actually not changed at all, but the penalty associated with that went away. So the minimum mandate is still there, but the penalty for not having the coverage you're supposed to have is, is going away. So arming them with, with that kind of information. And for the larger plan of employers, we built a plan that meets ACA and has a DPC. I think there was a question about the unshareable for $1,000. Yeah. Say I get that plan and I break my leg. Yeah. So I pay 1000 bucks. Right. And then I'm terrible, I like cut my hand. Yeah. I pay the first thousand bucks on that. You, you will. And then I have. Three times a year, though. So the maximum is three thousand. Three for you, five for the family. Once you pay that three times in a year, you won't pay it again, even if you have other issues. So so it's basically a three to five thousand dollar deductible. 
There's a $500 IUA too, so if you wanted that lower amount, the reason I do the higher amount with DPC is because DPC should be minimizing the need for that as much as possible, so I'd rather pay less to Sidera and pay a little more to my provider if I actually need it. But there's a 500, uh, and then on the employer side, actually, you can go up to 2,500. In your experience, how large or small does the company have to be when you really need a broker to customize their package plan, whereas you think more Sidera than I'd probably say 50 because that's when the employer mandate applies and now you've got to start worrying about compliance a little more. Not not because it's necessarily from a technical standpoint, but just the compliance issue okay. starts to bring that in. And then as you get up to 100 and above, the financing mechanisms on the back side of care become a little more complex and I think that then it certainly is. Uh, for the record, Sidera does offer a mech uh, component that, that, that can be added to it. Well, they don't offer it. That's where Redirect comes in. So they've partnered with companies like Redirect right. Right. to offer the MEC. So when we get, if we want to use Sidera for the larger groups, then we have to put the MEC in in order to satisfy the ACA. There is a solution right. for it. Right. Yeah. So one of the issues I run into personally, and why I have to use DPC personally, is because I'm on a sale of the plan. Yeah. So much. Is there anything you can do on a sale? Well, you can't use it, you can't use your HSA. I'm not a lawyer or, account, or an accountant, but I use my HSA money to my DTC membership. Oh. So, is there any IRS auditors in the room? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I have There's no uh, enforcement of that issue. Yeah, I know. I know. Yeah, I, you ask me, Michael Lubin will tell you they have millions of dollars every month coming from HSA accounts. Yeah, I hope it's no IRS auditors. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so, you, you're not supposed to, but okay. you can use that money any way you want. But I think the concept of what you're accomplishing is similar to what we're talking about with Sidera. It's like, have this umbrella policy for big stuff. The only problem in the fully insured world is you don't get the discounts on the premium you should get from not only having that catastrophic coverage, but we're saying, love it. Sidera will never I believe so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We're, it's we're not an insurance problem. We're currently in 46. So what the law says is you just have to charge fair market value as an employer for an HSA qualified individual. And one of the workarounds we've done with other employers is you put the fair market value in the employee's payroll deduction rather than at the point of entry on a, a, a copay or something like that. So, yeah. you know, there's no real case law that says you can't do that and nobody's ever been audited, but that is one solution uh, that if you document your um, policies as to how you develop fair market value and you embedded that in the employee payroll deduction probably they're paying it and you're done. Mm -hmm. So in the spirit of me not being able to avoid being a lawyer, um, <laughs> Al Capone got caught for tax evasion, <laughs> not anything else. Let's just be clear on this. Non-enforcement today does not mean non-enforcement next year when there's more um, in, we're in more momentum and what will happen is the more momentum the more likely the tax will come. I mean, there's crisis management PR firms, there's an entire industry dedicated to attacking things that people don't want around. I so figure it's a four and five hundred dollar tax liability mm -hmm. a year, so in ten yeah. years, I yeah. have five grand to give. And so, I, yeah. From the clinician standpoint, I've looked up people, family members or whatever say, hey, is there a DPC here? And I look them up and I look at their websites. Don't put on there that you can use your your HSA. No, I would not say that. Don't, don't get put it on your website. <laughs> it's that's really dumb. If, if it's a wink and a nod, if they do, it's like, oh, I didn't realize that credit card was that. And, you know. Yeah. Well, it's not on the DPC provider, of course. Yeah. I certainly wouldn't for most of right. So in the interest of time, I want to wrap up right everything up and hand it off to Michael for a second to wrap it up. But the whole purpose of us setting up this session was basically empower people to get crap done. There, this is just doing stuff in your backyards over and over and over again. And help Rosetta, if you think of us as trying to build the ecosystem to simplify that for everyone, um, throughout the rest of this year, we'll be rolling out various programs to answer a lot of these questions, to enable people to have resources, to act in their own communities, to bind together as communities, and um, cross over kind of the stakeholder lines. And so, um, but please just do things, like set apart time like every day to just do things that are beyond practicing medicine, and that's probably the single biggest thing to build the momentum, is just doing stuff.
all the time. <laughs> but it's not that hard. Entrepreneurship is just do, do stuff that people want over and over again until more people want it. So thank you everyone so much, and thank you for all the support you've given us.